Mm-hmm. Um, my husband at the time wasn't quite aware of of how much I was drinking. I did a lot of this by stealth. Um, had it hidden all over the house in different That's very bottles. Common, right? That's really, yeah. really common. Yeah, super common. Um, I had the, the the bottle on the table and then the bottle in the cupboard. So the one on the table is the one everyone thinks I'm drinking, and then I've got that to top myself up, and then one in the wardrobe. And yeah, yeah. and you know, I even hid it in shampoo bottles in the in the bathroom mm-hmm. when I needed to. Legends, welcome to another episode of the Interchange Podcast, and thanks for joining me, your host Ben Low. Now, before we go over to today's episode, I do have a very small favor to ask, and that is if you have been enjoying the podcast, even just the slightest little bit, if you can please subscribe and share this with just one of your friends that you think might get some value out of it, because as you know, the more eyes and ears we can get on the podcast, the bigger and better guests I can bring for you guys, and in turn, the more value we're going to be able to deliver. But over to today's guests, I am joined by Justine Santoviak, who Mm -hmm. is a wellness expert, a sobriety advocate, and an author. Oh. We got it right. Well, yeah, well, well done. done. Hi, high, high five to that. That was, like <laughs> that was a mouthful. But it was definitely a mouthful. Mm-hmm. But um, so Justine struggled with addiction to alcohol herself, mm-hmm. and is now using her journey, and her story, to challenge the status quo and change the thoughts and beliefs of what addiction and alcoholism is around the world. Yes. Yes. I am. Uh, I are. am. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm doing. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks very much for coming. Yeah. On, Justine. Thank you for I having me. Cannot you. wait to share your story because I know that there's so many people out there that struggle with alcohol addiction and because it is such a, I guess, readily available thing and so Mm -hmm. socially uh, accepted, it Mm -hmm. does get, I guess, less of a tarnish as opposed to like, you know, drug addiction or something like that. But I mean, for me personally, I know that alcohol, I watched my dad be an alcoholic um, growing up Mm -hmm. and I know that alcohol is probably the most dangerous of all because, well, number one, once again, it is so uh, readily available. But number two, because of the things that happen while people are, you know, using Under alcohol. the influence. Yeah, 100%. And you touched on that to begin with when you said it's so accepted. Mm. In, in our um, society, it's expected, not just accepted. So, oh, that's so it's, true, right? Yeah. yeah there's I'm a, going to the pub. I'm going to have a drink with the boys. Or, you know, go to a birthday party. You've got a drink. Yeah. Yep. Uh, you have a bad day from work. You have a drink. You come home. Kids are, uh, you know, if it comes to women, you know, the kids are playing up. They're stressed. They're overwhelmed. You have a glass of wine. Mm. So it's um, it's just in so many, you know, different facets of, of our everyday life. And mm. the, the, it's, it's at the moment what I'm trying to change is that it's normal to not drink also. I love Whereas, that. I yeah. love that. Yeah. And it's, it is, it is, I think one of the hardest, um, drugs that it is a drug and that's what we, we don't focus on enough, um, to maybe not necessarily kick in terms of physical, um, you know, symptoms and, and all that type of thing. Well, it's still pretty, pretty complex. Like, it's super complex if you're, yeah. if you're physically dependent, mm. but it's the after, um, integrating back into society and finding some kind of social norm for you that is mm. the most difficult. And that's where most people will fall off the wagon or not even get started to begin with because the idea of not drinking in an alcohol-obsessed society is just, it's its impossible. I can really connect with that because I remember when I stopped drinking. So there was a point in my life that I've spoken about a few times on the podcast and it was uh, about two, th- maybe three years ago now, uh, New Year's Day, I woke up. Actually, it was the day after New Year's Day, so the 2nd of January, which should have been a great you know, mm. sort of day for me because it's yep. like starting the new year, yep. new goals, you know, you, new you, all that sort of bullshit. Yep. And um, I'd woken up, I had a black eye, I'd crashed my car into the front fence of my house and I made an absolute dick of myself, probably the nicest house I've ever, ever been to. Yeah, and wow. I'd been drinking for two days straight. Um, I remember I was drink driving at the time as well. I just thought back to all the things that I'd done across those last couple of hours and I thought enough was enough. But... I actually had this feeling, this thought come up so many times prior, but due to the fact that everyone I knew was drinking and obviously you get invited to all these social events. And this is, I think, the year that I managed, I think it was the year I turned, I turned 29, but I had lots of friends that were turning 30. So there was all these 30th birthdays. Yeah. And I remember even going to all these 30s as a, you know, as, as a sober person. Yeah. And almost being judged. Yeah. You know, people are like, why aren't you drinking? Or you're a fucking pussy or, yeah. you know, uh, what you you think you're better than us even and all those sort of things. And so... Yeah. I guess my question to you is around this, like what was your rock bottom and then what was it that sort of got you um, to be able to really accept yourself for being this sober person because that is such a hard thing. Yeah, I think, you know, well, I guess my rock bottom, um, I've just gone 10 years sober, December it was 10 years, thank you, it was huge. Um, I... I, I have always, I guess, and I'll go back into childhood 
in a moment. But my mm. rock bottom was in 2012. Oh, the probably the 2011 was the year of my demise. I would I call it um, where you I had the events sort of started taking place. Yeah, yeah, like I literally. Oh, look, I I think I ha- I'd had some kind of dependency on alcohol for many years before mm. that. Mm. But 2011, I had a number of personal things happen that just. Um, left me with an inability to cope. I, I, I had learned very early on that I could use medic, use alcohol to medicate, right. so to cope. So I was using alcohol regularly. I mean, I was in my mid, oh, sorry, what was I, late 30s then. So I wasn't partying. I was medicating at home. You know, I'd so go out. Right. It's in, correct. And it's interesting because when I went out, I drank less. When I drank, I drank more at home. Mm. So, um, but I'd, I'd been continuously drinking um, and... By the end of 2011, I was probably drinking in some capacity 24-7. So I had a very – my anxiety was through the roof um, by the end of – During – while you were drinking or yeah. when you weren't? Beforehand, but yeah. then, you know, if you know the physiology – physiology and how or how chemically alcohol works on you it create it, it gives you that nice calm but then you have excessive exa- anxiety the next day yep. so it causes a chemical reaction that will make you more anxious so I was you know I was using it was a vicious cycle um and then I had a, a full-blown physical dependency so I had 2011 I had every illness under the sun I think I slept half the year and managed to somewhat semi-work half the year I had two small children at the time um my kids were around at that time they were like nine and and seven Mm -hmm. um my husband at the time wasn't quite aware of of how much I was drinking I did a lot of this by stealth um had it hidden all over the house in different bottles Yeah. yeah super common um, I had the, the, the bottle on the table and then the bottle in the cupboard. So the one on the table is the one everyone thinks I'm drinking and then I've got that to top myself up and then one in the wardrobe. And, yeah, yeah. and you know, I even hid it in shampoo bottles in the in the bathroom mm. when I needed to. But it, it became a, um, clearly a very strong physical addiction. I was very, very, very ill. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> I was going through my, my now ex-husband, who was my husband at the time, we were going through a lot. And I, um, I needed to, I guess my family were on the Gold Coast and I was in Melbourne. Mm. So they kind of made a bit of a mercy dash and they said, we're moving you up to Queensland for a little while just to kind of take me under their wing. But I don't think they knew quite the extent of how bad I was either. Yeah. I had broken my hand. I didn't even know how I'd done that. I, I lost, I was about 49 kilos. Wow. My GGT, if you know anything about your liver, should be around under 42. Mine was sitting at two and a half thousand. I was showing cirrhosis of the liver, yeah. signs of cirrhosis yeah, of the so liver. Yeah, yeah. Correct. Yeah. My platelets were, I was black and blue all over. Um, so I literally came back to the Gold Coast. My family got the general idea then of just how bad I was, sent me into doctors, psychologists, psychiatrists, and it was, my hand was very much forced to go into rehab somehow. My, my, I won't say, that was the general rock bottom. Was there one incident? I still talk about one particular one where my my mum and my my mum and dad were looking after my kids the bulk of the time because my husband at the time he was still working in Melbourne mm. and taking care of all the general duties because it was clear at that point I wasn't capable uh, and the only thing I cared about was my kids. Yeah. I didn't give a shit about anything else. I gave, all I cared about was my children. Mm. You know, people I'm going to digress but people always talk about you have to do it for yourself. When you don't give a shit about yourself you and you couldn't care less, I, I would have com- I would have ended up dead mm. if it wasn't for my kids because they were the only thing I cared about. So mum and dad were looking after the kids and this one day i just moved into a house. Dad had picked the kids up from school, brought them back to me and it was literally an analysis. He had to do analysis each time. Is she capable of looking after them now or not? And he came in. I'd snuck in. I think I've been to rehab maybe once um, cause I went in, in a day program, which I'll talk about in a minute, but he came in and he looked at me and he said, I can't leave the kids here with you. Mm. And I, I started to argue as I did back then. Cause I just, you know, I was very, um, confrontational, mm. very unlike what I'm actually genuinely like, but yeah, you know, yeah, alcohol yeah, makes like you do. Self, right? yeah, yeah. And alcohol just makes you, you know, I, I'm not the person I was in my addiction, but my daughter was on the couch and she looked at me and 
I'd been really fortunate. The kids didn't really know, or the kids didn't know I had an alcohol addiction. They knew mum was sick because I had a lot of people thankfully covering for me. So I slept a lot. I was sick a lot. Um, they never really saw me drunk falling over. It was, it was, mm. it was very much disguised. And my, my daughter looked at me with tears in her eyes and she said, mum, I'm scared you're never going to get better after my dad had said that. And I, you know what? It, it's still, and I, I, it happens every time I talk about it and I think about it, it still grabs me. And I'm, I hope that it does forever because it's a, it's a point in time where something snapped and it wasn't conscious. I can tell you right now, it sat on a subconscious level mm. and something said, you need to, <clears throat> You need to be here for these kids. You need to be the best version of you. So I literally then put one foot in front of the other and did everything everyone asked of me. Mm. And at that point, I did everything begrudgingly. Mm. I was not a willing participant Mm. to begin with until I was pretty much detoxed, I think. Yeah. So that was my my rock bottom. I I had a couple of... um, just prior to that, before before rehab, I had a couple of emergency visits, uh, non-conscious at 9.30 in the morning, having probably my blowing point 3.8 at about 9 o'clock in the morning in hospital. Um, and, yeah, having a couple of nights in st- short stay until I could get myself together. So some pretty scary stuff. I nearly, I, I nearly probably accidentally killed myself. I was never suicidal, but... Um, I could, I would have almost done it with what I was doing, yeah. especially in the latter part. I think it's by the by the grace of God or whoever you you know you look to for help um, that I'm still here. We're well, always getting those signs, aren't we, from the universe, from God, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, we get those you know taps on the shoulder, the taps on the shoulder until we get hit by that Mack truck. Yeah, it was not that day, <laughs> but I do remember in in hospital, in emergency when I was waiting and I was coming down and, oh, my God, you can imagine 0.38 at 9.30 in the morning, as you you know, and I was in seriously bad shape. And I just said, however, God, however, whatever I have to do to pay you back, get me out of this situation. And at that point, I didn't know what it was until I started talking about my recovery. Yeah. And now it's become obviously... What yep. you do. Yeah, it's crazy exactly. How, true. Um, and I guess a lot of people I have on here, also myself, we can use those stories that we have of our deepest, darkest places to actually come out and create such a beautiful thing. Yeah. But um, something you said was that the, the drinking started for you at a very young age. Yeah. I, I Look, I think I probably, you know, partied like everybody else in maybe 16 or something at a party, mm. you know, just having a casual drink. Um and I don't think it was a, it definitely wasn't an issue like really early on, but I do remember, um, one of the exercises in rehab was for us to start looking back at where we potentially, where oh, I know for myself, where I started, um, medicating with alcohol, as opposed to it being something that, you know, like probably only 2% of the population can do very much socially put it down kind of thing. Yeah. And I remember I was 19. <sighs> I'd been um, on and off with the boyfriend that was apparently the love of my life. And I just couldn't cope with the the on off thing. And I was house sitting a friend's, um, one of my parents' friends' homes. Mm. And we're showing my age now, but the, the phone rang it was a wall phone (laughs) yeah it was a wall phone and he was calling me to say look I can't we can't do this anymore this time it's all over Mm. and it was already like 11 o'clock at night I was already in bed so I got out of bed to go and answer the phone and I remember walking to the fridge grabbing a couple of stubbies Mm. at the time walking back to bed and drinking in them in bed until I was calm enough to sleep and I think that that was the first time that I truly learned that I could numb all the shit out and get myself into some kind of semi calm state with alcohol. Yeah. Clearly yeah. didn't know it at the time, <laughs> but yeah. then I, I knew I could rely on that mm. down the track. And so that then became like the, the coping mechanism. To some yeah. Degree. I think this is the thing, right? That a lot of people don't understand is they think that alcohol is actually the problem. There's usually actually an underlying issue, but you know, beneath that. Yeah. And they're using it as a way to avoid that, to avoid the pain, to avoid the discomfort. Whether it be drugs, alcohol, I call it the big four: drugs, alcohol, womanizing, and gambling. Yep. Right. Mm-hmm. Whatever. You yeah. Know. Yeah, but it's just 
it, it a lot of the time we're trying to address the symptom which is the alcohol right but it's yeah. actually having to work on ourselves first to yeah to overcome that and so I guess with that and obviously being in rehab was that something that you went through was actually working on your self-worth and working on I guess building yourself back up after coming from such a I guess a place of tragedy yeah definitely I think um and I know we're talking about this off air as well so much look we you've got two things happening with that. So you, you learn to medicate. You mean there's always something going on, you know, behind the scenes mm-hmm. that's making you potentially drink in the first yeah, place course, yeah. that you've got to deal with. But then you're actually inducing an addictive substance. Mm-hmm. So and you're you actually... reliance on that thing. Yeah, so yeah. then you're not only psychologically relying on it, you're physically dependent on it. Mm-hmm. So for me, I couldn't, I couldn't detox without without being on medication because I would have had a heart attack and died. So I needed a medical detox. Not everybody does. And that's the whole thing. You know, we talk about this spectrum of drinking is that it's really, it's important people understand I wasn't like that all the time, but I always did use alcohol as a medicator. I just wasn't always as physically dependent on it. So we got from where it was to obviously. Yeah, there's a scale. It doesn't happen overnight. So just because, you know, you're not necessarily in the in in that end position where I was, it's not not an issue for you. Mm-hmm. You know, my issues stemmed way earlier than that. Yeah. Um. But yeah, there is. I had to do a lot of work on myself. Rehab. I went in a day program, so I didn't actually go in as a resident because yeah. I I pleaded essentially with family and my doctors not to leave my kids because I really wanted to be. I wanted to come home at night and be yeah. with my children. So, um. I went in, you know, nine o'clock in the morning or whatever it was and out at four o'clock in the afternoon, driven there and back because I wouldn't have gone otherwise. Um, And I actually did the day program twice and we focused a lot on, it was a lot of cognitive, it was a lot of CBT, but it was a lot of mindfulness. Mm. Um, But for me, I'm a super, super visual person and, and I'm what? extremely kinesthetic so i one of the things that I'd, I'd, I'd gone to psychologists before i did a bit of counseling went to one aa meeting that wasn't for me because i'm not like them and i think <laughs> a multiple a, a multitude of things happened for me in yeah. rehab and that was it was group environment yeah and Being i'm really like yep minded people that are yep. trying to do something for themselves right a hundred percent yeah um and the type of therapy or the, the way we were i guess discussing what was going on so i i learnt some really basic things like what happens with an anxiety attack or anxiety and where the, the scale that it goes on. And then when <clears> most <throat> people intervene with a substance of some kind, and then they showed where it will naturally dissipate if you don't. And it's about this far away. Mm. And I went, Oh shit. So if I'd only waited that extra, whatever, I would actually not have needed the the um you know the numbing out solution the yeah. drug that might for me the alcohol yeah. um and just understanding my head a lot more mm. um i have obsessive compulsive disorder okay. so that was probably diagnosed well actually formally only diagnosed about five years ago but i have always known that there's something going on always had general anxiety um and yeah so i started to deal with that look i think just even not being with having a clear head again and it takes a period of time to get there just gave me the capacity to begin with to go okay I can start moving forward but the, the the I guess the biggest um the catalyst for me for really stepping up and and getting well was when my psychologist said I think you should exercise yep 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 which sounds like that should have been somewhere a lot earlier on. Well, but now knowing what you know, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Right? But, like, it doesn't come as, you know, second nature to a no. lot of people because, well, I guess, especially your, your generation, it wasn't so pushed on us. Even no. for me as a kid, like, it was like, hey, do, like, 30 minutes of exercise a day, but that could look like this, 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 and this. Yeah. It was never really pushed on us. But with what you're saying then, obviously, with what we're saying off air, I believe that exercise or even just giving you some sort of regime or structure or routine really yeah. just... It is honestly the answer to a lot of these things. Yeah. Because it's, it creates, like you said, physical change. It creates also a physiological change. Yeah, right? definitely. And I think it's 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 not the magic pill, but it's the one key element, all of those <laughs> things, that will 100% provide you with a formula for you to get well and stay well. I say, you know, fitness got and kept me sober. So 
And it definitely does. You know, I know now it doesn't make me exempt from life's challenges. It doesn't mean I don't get anxious now. It doesn't mean I don't have shit happen. I've just gone through last year. I went through a divorce, a massive financial pressure. My business literally went on hold for 12 months, a huge amount of life shit. But I knew the worst thing I could do was drink because if I drank, I would not have the capacity to cope with it. Yeah, um, the my, go away temporarily for that couple that's of it. moments. Yeah. And the next day, it's like you're borrowing tomorrow's happiness, really. Yeah. So there was basic things, you know, my basic formula. When Whenever I'm feeling stressed or overwhelmed, I go back to sleep, eat, exercise. And mm. anything that's what I would call an ancillary or something that's that you have is a by the way, isn't, doesn't need to be done right now, stops until those things have got my nervous system and my, you know, whatever else is going on back to an equilibrium. Yep. where I can then go, no, okay, that's not real. This is where we're at. This is what I need to do. And, you know, um, you go from there. And so at what point in your journey of recovery did you adopt this mindset of, you know, sleep, eat and recover? Um, I think I started training. So I went to, re- I finished my last bit of my rehab program. I went to Crumbin Clinic, yeah. Crumbin Site Clinic yeah. um, in, in May of twenty. 12 and I started training so my family my whole family were on the Gold Coast and they made me join fitness first and uh, in all this varsity now or whatever Rabina I think it was called then uh, because one my psychologist said it's good for you to exercise and I'm like yeah whatever I was I was one of those token gym members I went to the gym twice a year when I had a wedding or something to lose no, but yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> yeah. So I went... You got a call from me at some point, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I was ticking boxes that everyone else wanted. And I went. I met a PT <clears throat> in the gym that was clearly trying to, you know, get clients. And it was my ex-husband at the time, or husband at the time, that said, oh, look, I don't want... It. He had approached him and he said, I don't want any sessions, but my wife might. Mm-hmm. I'm going, oh, God, how embarrassing. How, how, why did you tell them that, you know? I was still training in the women's gym. I didn't even want to come down He's to... I had no idea. idea. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it was... Okay, anyway, I met this guy. Could not have been a better, better candidate for me. Mm-hmm. Loads of trouble himself at some point in time. <laughs> Ex-boxer. Mm. just literally had uh you do it or you don't mentality mm. crossfit mm. now i know that's not everyone's cup of tea but for me that was because that was a lot of endurance that was a lot of power of mind to begin with yeah. and it was everything that i didn't know how to do so he wasn't at the gym for very long i ended up training with him he set up a studio at home and i did crossfit style training and i can just remember pennies dropping <clears throat> excuse me everywhere where I would do something that I, I never imagined I could physically do after months. And then I'm like, it's your mind that did that. If you can do that physically, you can change how your mind, um, you know, your, your resilience, your strength, your power of mind. You can push yourself like that. You can push those thoughts and everything else that you didn't think that you could do mm. as well. So it became the the correlation between physical and mental health was so bloody obvious to me that I'm like, holy shit, this is what is keeping me together at the moment. This is what's making me stronger. This is what's keeping me sober. And this is what's making me physically well again. Mm. And it became my formula. And so much so that that later that year, just before my 40th birthday, I went and decided I was, I was a corporate person. Mm. Um, and I decided that I wanted to become a PT Yeah, (laughs) and I, it started from there. It just started from there. And I just knew, hang on a second. Um, I've found a formula. I need to talk about it and where my writing came into it. And when, when we talk about, you know, finding your purpose or, you know, that conversation I had in emergency with God that I said, I'll pay you back. And I didn't know what it was. I started Back in the early days of, of Facebook and, uh, and Instagram, I started talking about my PT and my business and stuff, but then talk, started openly, very cautiously, because I was not 100% ready to talk about everything, my alcohol journey. Mm. And the more I wrote, the more responses I got from people messaging me saying, holy shit, I'm you. I don't know how to get out. I'm not the only one, right? It's yep. like that relatability piece. Yeah. Yeah. But... The di- distinct difference was that I'd found the formula. They were still stuck. Yeah. And I, these messages, overwhelming amount of messages of, I don't know how to get out. That was the penny dropping going, 
you're the one to lead the way. Mm. Whatever you do. So then I still wasn't 100% sure what that was. I knew that was my PTing. And it wasn't until people, I started blogging more on what was blogging back then that somebody said to me, you should write a book. Mm. And then, you know, it was extreme. It was something I'd done when I was a lot younger, um, but extremely cathartic. And um, yeah, that became my outlet. So personally, that helped me grow. But then I was all of a sudden had a purpose. Yeah. I was helping other people. I think it's a beautiful thing. And a lot of people have a very similar journey with like fitness. It's like I started it because it actually saved my life. But now it's actually become something that I want to use to help other people. Yeah. And so for anyone out there that might be struggling with similar to what you were, I guess, how would they recognize that, hey, this is, and this is the thing, a lot of the time it's unconscious. They don't even realize that they're on that sliding scale of going from, being a social drinker to being someone that's really stuck in addiction. Yeah. Like what signs would you have people look out for to say, hey, look, maybe it's time to pull that up and maybe even reach out for some help. I think assessing your relationship with alcohol at any point in time is important, but Mm. I'm of the strong belief (sighs) that if you're already questioning your relationship with alcohol, you've probably got an issue to some degree. That's not necessarily like mine was, but if you're questioning it, there's a reason you, you, subconscious talks to you before your conscious course, talks to you so i think that you know i think there is also a lot of merit in it's not necessarily do you have to have an issue with it to it to benefit from not drinking yeah. that's what i'm trying to you know probably push a lot more is that there are so many benefits to not drinking even drinking small amounts of alcohol has impact a of lot course. of impact yeah. but um you know signs of where it's becoming probably or problematic would be, you know, is it inhibiting you from doing your everyday functions? Do you try and fit your life in around your alcohol or drug consumption as opposed to the other way around? Yeah. Is it, how is it impacting your relationships? Um, do you wake up the next day and regret everything that you've done? Um, mm-hmm. You know, there's a multitude of things where I think you're already more than likely you've had your subconscious talk to you about it already. Mm. There's, you know, is it, what, what's it impacting? Yeah, I think that's a really good point to make because, mm. I mean, when you do get to that point, you look around, it probably is it, it's affecting your relationships, your mental health, your emotional health, even your spiritual health to some yeah. degree, physical health. Yeah. There's all these things that obviously happen on a sliding scale, but a lot of the time when people go, okay, now I am ready. Yeah. They haven't listened to the subconscious chatter. Yeah. It's already not too late. They've already gone so far. Yeah, it becomes a lot harder to pull it back. Mm. Um, But yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely, I don't think it does anybody any harm to have a break from alcohol. Couldn't agree more. For for a period of time. (laughs) Couldn't agree more. Just to assess how different you are. And and I'm all for these, you know, one month off, that kind of thing. But I really think you need to have at least uh, six to 12 months off Mm. to actually truly gauge how how much better you are into everything performance for, for life yeah, couldn't agree um more. without alcohol my partner now he's been he he said he was going to have a year off like he didn't drink like i did he was much more of a binge social drinker yeah he's a lot younger than i am up for a weekend, right? <laughs> well yeah yeah definitely <laughs> yeah. i don't drink through the week so i make up for the weekend yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah definitely and you know um he was getting to a point where he didn't like he just, it wasn't, it didn't serve the purpose that it had done for a long time. He said, I'm going to have a year off. Um, and he's English and he's a tradie. And like that was a massive task because. Oh, there it is. Because those cultures right there, well, first of all, being English and then yeah. second of all, the trade culture. Yeah. It's like, what do you do at lunchtime? Yeah. Go to the pub, have a beer. When yeah. Well, work, <laughs> he, couldn't, he couldn't do that in this job, but that's yeah. 100% it is, it is mm-hmm. what you do. Um, so, you know, there was a period of definitely, and, you know, I could talk about that too, but, but social, you have to, you have to actually pull back socially for a period of time to preserve yourself. Cause otherwise, you know, we think that we're infallible and that we can't, that we, that we could, we should be able to walk into an environment we're in before and just not drink. That's mm. not how we work when you're so, it's so ingrained in you that it's that's what you do. So long, yeah, right? correct. But he said 12 months off and he's now at 17 months. Amazing. And it got to the 12 months and he goes, I'm actually not quite sure. And if you ask, it's it's amazing the amount of mates of his that message him and say, hey, 
you still are you not drinking and he's like yeah i'm still not drinking he's like i think i need to stop how Uh, did you do it yeah and and i think i need to stop and it's just it's so interesting when for a period of time i know he thought oh god everyone thinks that i'm you know i'm no longer i'm not going to be fun all those Mm. sorts of things Mm. but it's pretty much the opposite yeah definitely let's talk into that a little bit more so obviously around the the fear that a lot of people have of stopping drinking right yeah and being able to find people that don't drink because that was definitely something that i really struggled with was being able to feel like there are other people out there that weren't doing you know the thing that everyone does yeah of course so with the i guess the stopping drinking side of things you were saying before obviously there's so many benefits to not drinking as opposed to the benefits of drinking yeah like i want to actually play the devil's advocate here what what is there (laughs) what what are the benefits of drinking of drinking yeah huh I don't reckon there's any. I don't reckon there's... I personally, having been, you know, 10 years sober, I don't think that there's any benefits to drinking. Mm. Because even if you, you know, honestly, I'd, I'd be lying if I said there was. Because even things like, you know, people saying, well, I have... Even socially, if it's not an issue, like have one or two, you can do that without drinking and have just a good, as good a time. It's just an... You have to unlearn a habit. Yeah. So I mean, thing, right? it's, it's unlearning the habit because it's something yeah. that I've brought up with, like I said for myself, like watching dad drink. Yeah. It was just a done thing. He comes home from work, he has a, you know, half a bottle of whiskey, <laughs> you know? In Australia and the UK and, you know, a few of those other sort of co- closely intertwined cultures, mm. we, we drink to celebrate, we drink to commiserate and we drink for anything in between. It is literally, it's definitely ingrained in our culture and we are not very good at supporting other people when they decide to put the glass down and break that cycle we collectively as as a a society and particularly in Australian culture see that person as abnormal and you know you're talking before about why aren't you drinking you're much I've had clients and people that I've worked with friends other sober friends where people have literally said we don't invite, you're no fun when you don't drink. I don't want you to come on to this party or the, because if, unless you, unless you're drinking, don't come. It's, it's you're the just, weird one. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, there is just Ugh. this inability to support somebody's choice to fucking look after themselves. That's all it is. Mm. It's their choice of self care. You know what? I, people say to me, what do I say when, when I now I'm not drinking Just say, you know what? I don't like who I am when I drink. I don't like the things I say. I don't like the things I do. And I want to look after me. People shut up. I think the, the other thing <laughs> but about it's, that, People are scared to say that. That's right. They're, they're scared to yeah. own it. But I think there's a big fear there of losing friends and a fear of oh, judgment, yeah. right? But yeah. at the end of the day, if you're going to stop drinking, this is something that I really noticed with the stopping when I was, you know, stop doing drugs and stop yeah. selling drugs. You notice real quick who your real friends are. Yeah. You notice really fucking quick who actually wants to spend time with you. And I think it's yeah. actually probably one of the most beautiful things you can have because if you look at it like that, it's actually helping you to separate who's going to have your back and who doesn't. Yeah, there is a natural weaning process. Mm. And I, I actually personally love it because exactly as you said and for different reasons, I think you also will ascertain who's you've got something in common with other than you drink together. Yeah. Um, you know, value, equal exchange in terms of value of friendships, relationships, mm. Um all of those things, nobody likes their own inadequacies to be highlighted. Mm. And that's what happens when you stop drinking and around somebody that's probably got an issue with it themselves. It highlights that for them. And their immediate reaction is to make you feel as if you're not normal. Yeah, it's like that deflecting, right? Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So it makes it really... Um, complex for people to just even make the choice to stop. Cool. Okay, so for anyone that does want to stop drinking or even like, I guess, look at giving it a break, what would be your top five tips to get started with that? Yeah. Uh, number one would be you got to know what level of dependency you've got. So if mm. you are drinking extremely regularly, yeah. there's every chance you've got a physical dependency. So my first port of call is always go to your GP. Okay, and if they, what would be signs of a physical dependency? Uh, you're starting to, you know, you're physically craving it. Mm. Um, you know, at the at the end of the day, you're getting detox kind of symptoms, you know, withdrawal symptoms the next day after you're drinking. Yeah. Um, you know, you feel like you physically need to drink to, yeah, to calm yeah, yeah. all of those symptoms down. Yeah. I'm not a doctor, so... <laughs> 
make sure you always see your doctor because they're not the only symptoms of physical yeah. dependency, clearly. But I think you know when you feel like you can't go without. Um, yeah, and if you've not gone had an alcohol-free day for some period of time, there's probably every chance that you're physically dependent. So, even if you're not, I actually think you should go and see your GP. Mm. There's two reasons for that. One, you've got some medical assistance if you need it. Yeah. Two, if you haven't told anyone else, there's your first person that you're actually becoming accountable to yeah. and telling your truth. Because that load gone off your yourself is a massive step mm. to actually admit. And I didn't do the AA program. I understand the concepts and, you know, some of the 12 steps I definitely follow just you know, naturally, yeah. but it is that admitting that you're, that alcohol's got you by the balls, mm. you don't have control of it anymore. Taking ownership, right? That's yeah. a big part of it. And I think that also helps to alleviate some of the shame and guilt. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So definitely get medical assistance. I would say the second one is make sure that you've got a really good support network around you. Yep. Yep. No, yep. we don't all have that. Go find it mm. because sometimes our family and friends are our worst advocates. Yeah. So uh, there is a, a, a plethora of people online now, I think, that you know that you can connect with that are mm. sober, already already where you want to be kind of thing that you don't necessarily have to relate to 100%, but they've at least they've done, they've walked the walk. Yeah, model some of their shit. Yeah. yeah. Three, get your runners on as soon as you can. Yeah. Literally walk the fucking block 4,000 times. If you're not a gym person, and I, that's what I did the, yeah. to very, very early days. It was literally when I got a craving, I walked the beach. Mm. I walked Burley, North Burley that many times that it just became, you know, I think I could do it in my sleep. You have to think of worse places to be walking. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't have a belly in North Burley, the block is completely yeah, fine. Yeah, most yeah and sure. most people don't. I, yeah. I don't ever take that for granted either. Yeah. Um, you know, definitely get your exercise, exercising, get a handle on your sleep. Mm. That's always a little bit complex as well. Once you stop drinking, because your body is probably very adjusted to falling asleep with alcohol yeah. because it does, it makes you sleepy, but then you'll have a turbulent night because that's how it, you know, it works on our system. Um, sometimes falling asleep can be a big issue. So the exercise helps that because it will make you naturally sleepy. Yeah. I then went on a, a, a myriad of herbal, you know, anxiety, teas, all sorts of things, just to try and get myself, you know, in a calmer state to sleep. It took a while, but you've got to be persistent. And then get yeah. get a handle on your on your food as well. I mean, they're the beginning, very beginning things. It's You know what? All that's just self-care. It's like basic stuff. It's literally self-care. Right? Yeah. And it's the stuff that we don't do when we're so caught up in that – I can't remember applying any element of self-care when I was knee deep in addiction or even when I was just, you know, in the psych, the loop of, oh, well, I've come through the door. It's been a big week. This has happened. I've got the bill for this or whatever. I've had a five wines. Oh, then I've got shit food and then I'm not going to go to the gym anyway. So, mm. you know, self-care, even when I wasn't drinking 24 seven was a lot less prevalent because I was too busy trying to cope with everything else. I think this is where most people struggle is because we were speaking about this off air as well. It's like they're looking for the magic pill. Mm. They want the quick fix. They want the thing that's going to make them better now. But a lot of them will get the, you know, even doing like a, a four weeks of um, sobriety, right? Yeah. And they're like, I'm doing really good. I feel really good. But all of a sudden they self-sabotage and put them back, self back at square mm. one. And they're like, well, that was fucking pointless because, you know, I, now I'm back now drinking. Mm. So yeah. I think that the easiest thing to look at is, okay, like you said, the basics, doing the things that you can do. Yeah. Because obviously that yields results, but it's like long term, right? And obviously where you're at now, you're almost ten oh, sorry, just over ten years yeah. sober. And that journey there wouldn't have been easy. There would have been days where you felt like shit and you're like, Well, you know, I really want to have a drink. Oh, for sure. Um, look, I I will say in the first couple of years I definitely lost that connection to want to to use alcohol to numb out. Mm. A lot of people, even even my psychologist for a while said it's actually quite unusual. I lost that quite early on. Mm. Maybe that's because I really did um, ramp up that self-care to begin with. Yeah. Maybe not. Um, but I also did a 360 life change. So I had to, you talked about before, you know, the fear of losing friends and all that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. I moved back into state. <sighs> I started afresh with a lot of things. Sometimes that's what you've got to do. And, Couldn't agree more. Yeah. and, and that's, that can be hard. Um, but I had, 
as I said before, giving up alcohol didn't make me exempt from life's challenges. So <laughs> over the last 10 years, many things could have made me, it would have in the past would have been the first thing I would have done was drink. Mm -hmm. But my dad, he's um, just gone 38 years sober. Wow. And dad um, said to me before I stopped drinking and I just couldn't relate. He said to me, you know what, Justine? He said, I, I know now that I'll cope with anything life throws at me as long as I don't drink. Yeah. And I was like, you're fucking crazy. How? Even, I'll tell you, because I, I drank after rehab yeah. the first 12 months on the odd occasion because mm. I thought I could be a social drinker because at that point, I'll be honest, even after the rehab, I still thought I can't have it completely out of my life. It can't be completely out of my life because it needs to be somewhere. Where did that belief come from for you? Social norm. Yeah. Social norm and also I still, still had an element of if something really terrible happens. At least you've got the thing. <sighs> Correct. Yeah. And that eventually went when I realized that my strength of character, my strength of mind will only be in the capacity that it is now if I don't drink. And whatever what my dad said was 100% true. You know, life will... Alcohol's never going to make anything better. It'll only make it worse. So you you tackle shit head on. Mm, I think that's um, you know, a really good point to make because, like I was saying before, like you can do the thing where you, you start drinking for four weeks, six weeks, eight mm. weeks, whatever it is, but it's all about that consistency, right? Yeah. To actually get the effects because, I mean, if you've been drinking for years, like for me personally, I was addicted to ice for eight years. Yeah, wow. Right? And so I was in jail for four years. I was actually forced to quit. Yeah. Um, the longest time I was in there was a year and a half. But it's, it's still even today. I'm now seven years clean off the ice. Yeah, right. And I still think it affects me to the day. Like, you know, sometimes mm. I'll just like zone out and I won't be as clear as what I was. But yeah. I do notice that and I do know for a fact that every day that's gone on since being clean uh, from the ice, like life's just gotten better. Things yeah. have gotten easier. Yeah. And obviously there's going to be those times where you want to revert back to it. Yeah. But it's like, you know, taking one step forward to take two steps back. Yeah. Oh, definitely. I... Look, and, and it's interesting, you know, when I, you know, separated from my ex-husband and he, I'll give him credit when, you know, he was a very um, strong support part of me getting mm -hmm. sober and changed his life a lot as well to, to help me. But I remember when I was, you know, in my head battling with the decision, do I want to be here, do I not want to be here? And he did not drink at all, but yeah. he drank minimally. Yeah. I, I remember going, holy fuck. If I have to go out there again and find somebody, I'm, I can, can I actually even be with someone that drinks? Mm -hmm. You know, like it, there was so many things, but it was weird because I was like, doesn't fucking matter, Justine. If you're a cat lady for the rest of your life, but you're sober, who gives a shit? And it was never going to happen. But <laughs> you know, it was, it was, it was honestly like, it, there's nothing more important. My sobriety has to come first, so that everything else in my life. Can, can exist as it does. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. So let's talk a bit more into the work that you do now. So yep. obviously you coach people with uh, sobriety and that side of things. Yeah, look, my I'm not a qualified counsellor. Yep. So I'm what we would call a lived expert. Mm. <laughs> There's always my disclaimer. But right? hey, you know, I don't know that that many people want to, to, you know, have sort of, I guess, guidance or be mentored by somebody that hasn't walked the walk either. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more. So, you know, yeah. it's, it's mentoring, but my, my programs are very much based around knocking alcohol on the head, but using health and fitness. So it's health and fitness related and mindset stuff. So mm. they're my programs. Um, I've just, I've just done a full big rebrand and up, dated all of my services. Um, I'm also, I still write and I'm writing for different publications. I do a fair bit of public speaking when I can. Um, and my, one of the things that I'm working on at the moment that I hope to have up and running by the end of the year is a program for high schools. I love that. I yeah. absolutely fucking love that. Cause that's actually something I'm very passionate about also, because the thing is, if we can get to it before it becomes a real big issue, yeah. that's where change is going to be made. And for me, with the, the high school and working with kids, like I want to work with like 13 to 18 year old men, young men. Yeah. Because one day my son, he's five years old, is going to be that age. Yeah. And he's going to have that fork in the road where it's like, hey, 
you know, you either go the path which I walked or you have the support and actually you have that rite of passage into manhood and learn all the things you need to learn, right? Yeah. It's like getting to the problem before it becomes a problem. Definitely. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm sort of thinking for me with what I want to do is sort of around 14, 15 and teaching alternative coping mechanisms. Mm. And I just want to demonstrate there there is other ways and for me that's what it is you know so there are other ways to cope with stress and overwhelm not necessarily just drugs and alcohol and you know it it, it is just so normalized the first thing <clears throat> your girlfriend breaks up with the boyfriend or the kids are stressed <laughs> or whatever it's like come over we'll crack a bottle of wine yeah, that's it. it is it's it's just Nothing what we know i can't fix right correct worst advice i've ever been, been given <laughs> literally worst advice i know so it's it's it honestly it's um yeah that's something i'm super passionate about and i'm working on now and um you know girls and guys i i have i have a strong female based um, I guess following, mm. but I have this silent male based following that is very much the private message and not those, well, those messages come as well, but the, <laughs> but <laughs> the, the correct, yeah, slide into DMs. Correct. Yeah, exactly. But they are silent cries for help yeah, of course. because, and they, men interact very differently as you know, cause that's mm. what you do. Mm-hmm. But with this sort of stuff, men find women a softer landing in some ways. Yeah. So they're not the ones that are as obvious, but they definitely, there's a market there as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And there's it, a lot less judgment, I think, from a female, from a male to a female quite often, initially. Definitely. I couldn't agree more with that. And I guess a lot of times, the, especially with mates of mine, they, they've spoken about wanting to work with female counsellors and things like that. Because yeah. Because they feel like it's a, a safer space. Yeah. Whereas it feels very... Um, hard to be vulnerable with men it's unnatural because what we've which been is shit whole life correct that, you know vulnerability is weakness you yeah know? like i said before big boys don't cry lots of no stuff. And yeah for, for men for this manly man to reach out and ask for help it's like well you're, you're less of a man is what is what the you know societal norm would have us think yep yep definitely so you know that's what i would like to to move into and just continually pushing you know i like to be provocative Oh, you know, we talk about the word thought leader. I love that because I, I want to question even my partner now goes, oh, I could, jokes as you know, I could actually just go and have a beer. And I'm like, what? Okay, tell me why. Why would you want to you do that? that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's not don't. It's like, why? What's what's made you do that? And wh- I, I believe it's my responsibility because I'm fairly confident in my sobriety and mm. I'm confident in the path that I've taken and how I've taken it, that I need to lead that, that the way for those that don't have a strong voice, because there are many people that are struggling to put the, put the, the glass down or the bottle away or whatever you want to, you know, mm. drugs or whatever it might be, because they're walking in back into a society where what they're trying to do is abnormal. That has to change. It yeah. has to change. It has to be choice. Yeah. And we have to, you know, remove the, the bullying culture mm. around it. You know, birds of a feather kind of thing. Um, and we have to start embracing people's choices and allowing them to actually fucking look after themselves because that's all they're doing. I think there's definitely been a bigger, a bigger shift towards that awareness, especially yeah. in the last few years. Like you, you see now there's a lot. This could just be because now I've exited the alcoholism culture and also the partying culture, but... I feel like there really has been a big shift in the last five, ten years where yeah. it is a lot more accepted now. Yeah. You know, where it's also like... And it's, it, in generations. Like my kids are 22 and 19 yeah. and it definitely is... That, they don't drink that much at all. My yeah, daughter hardly it's, ever it's drinks. Cool not to. But there's right. still a massive portion of... I don't know how old you are. 32. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Pretty much there and slightly older through to 70s yeah. that it's still... I don't understand. This is the only way you, you, this is what you do. Yeah. That's it. And so if you could make a difference in the world, what would that look like? And how would you, I guess, have that impact to allow people to be able to speak about these things? I literally want to be the example of what you can do, what you can achieve, how happy you can be, healthy, clear-minded, motivated, determined. And regardless of what choice of career or job, and you know, I, 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 um, I don't, people don't have to be me, Mm. but I want them to be their best version of themselves. And you can't do that while you're under the influence of a, of a drug. Yeah. 
at the end of the day, you just can't, you know, I, it's, it's interesting even with my business in the past, I, I'm quite, um, comfortable. I was in the music industry a very long time in my, not in my early, you know, teens and twenties and travel all over the world and signed to Sony Records. It was a nineties pop star kind of thing. Yeah. So I literally, I, I'm not shy in, um, in regards to, you know, making statements, speaking up and all that type of thing. So yeah. I really feel like I've been chosen you know, I had this sabbatical in my thirties where I just didn't even know who I was. A, a camera, I, I ran from a camera because I, I, I didn't want to be anywhere near it. I hated myself. Yeah. And now I f- almost feel like it's, you're taking back on that role, mm-hmm. but with a purpose that's yeah. going to save lives. I love that. I love hmm. that. And before we finish up, if there was one piece of advice you could give your 16 year old self, what would it be? <sighs> Don't be so scared. That's hard with an anxiety disorder, but yeah, what don't be. I, I think, you know, when you have a baseline that is always going to throw you in everything you do, the worst case scenario, and yep. I still do, mm-hmm. I'm, I can't untry, I, I try and, I try and shift that and I work with it and I manage it a ton better than I ever did drinking, but it's like everything will always work out. The, the worst case scenario is even the worst case scenario, you'll, you'll move through it. Yeah. You'll be okay. And, um, yeah, it's, it's just really important for, for me. If I, if I'd known that to begin with, I would have seen, you know, what spoke about rehab being a visual person. If I'd been able to visualize the end result not being catastrophic, I don't think I would have started intervening as much as I did. Yeah. But you know, stress and overwhelm can be dealt with so many other ways. Um, and that I am worth making the effort. You know, there was a very long time there where I didn't like myself at all. Mm. And if I'd probably, if I'd, you know, just slipped away somewhere, maybe everyone would have been better off. But I know that's not the truth. It's definitely not the truth. Not the truth now. <laughs> no, no. you need to share your truth. Yeah. And thank you very much for coming on, Justin. Really yeah. No, it. thank you for having me. It's Great so chat. If people want to find you, where can they find you? Oh, okay. So, um, all the plugs. <laughs> all the plugs. Um, if, uh, my website's Justine Santoviak. Perfect. Yeah. I'm sure you'll have links somewhere there. All below. Correct. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, my Instagram, which is, um, just Whitchurch. There we go. I'm just throwing a spatter in the work said that was my married name. I've gone back to my maiden yeah, name. We had this discussion yeah. Which is all, it's actually, it's really good though. It's actually, see, we, we, we are always evolving. This yeah. is a fresh start for me. This is actually a good segue. Actually, it's a good opportunity for me to go back to when I was younger and I feel like I have this opportunity now to finish off some of the, the business before I got married the first time in my early twenties mm. and, um, be that person, but with, you know, the, all of these added bonuses of, of life experience. Picking so up your authentic yeah, self to some degree, yep, right? exactly. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Cool. Well, thanks very much. Really appreciate you coming on. No, thank you. My pleasure. Cool.